Hey, right now, my name is Dr. Andrew Bernard. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons here at Oakland, Virginia, the Johnson Lewis location. And I'm happy to be talking to you guys and having a conversation about technology and joint replacement. So um, going, looking at joint replacement, we'll talk about um, overall the indications for doing the total hip and total knee replacement. Also, we'll talk about some advancements in the design of prosthesis that we use today. Um, we'll also go a little bit into robotics, talking about robotic assisted surgery, um, navigation, and also patient specific instrumentation and also some augmented reality as well. So just a little bit about me and how I came to Ortho Virginia in this area is that I'm a first generation American. Uh, my parents came over from Nigeria in the 80s and had a couple boys here. I was born in the Washington DC area. Um, subsequently, I also went to school in that area as well. I got my bachelor's degree from Howard University in Engineering. And then I went on and got a master's and a doctorate degree from Howard as well. After I finished residency, I went on to do my orthopedic training at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. And then after I finished the five years of training, I went on to University of Chicago, where I did a fellowship in um, hip and knee replacement. And so I've been here at the Johnson Willis location serving the Richmond area now for the past six or seven months, and it's been, it's been a blast. So just get, kind of getting into the talk here. Um, the first thing is talking about the indications for doing the joint replacement. Now in this talk, we're just gonna specifically talk about just hip and knee replacements. Um, there are other types of joint replacements, elbow, shoulder, and ankle, but we're gonna focus just strictly on the hip and knees. And so the indications to do surgery is when you have end-stage arthritis of your joint. And here's an example of what end-stage arthritis looks like in a knee, where you see that you have worn away cartilage, you have the underneath bone exposed, and also you have hardening of the bone and bone spurs. And what that leads to is pain in the joint and that pain limits function. Now, there's ways to treat it conservatively with injections. I know you've probably seen commercials for vis visco supplementation injections, um, steroid injections, therapy, weight loss, home exercises. All these things are basically a stopgap in order to prolong the inevitable, which is potentially having a replacement of your joint. Also, this can also happen in the hip where you have arthritis of your hip joint and that leads to wearing away of the cartilage which leads to pain. The main reason to do a joint replacement surgery is when the pain is at a certain level or point where it's now limiting your function, limiting you from doing activities you like to do, whether it be walking, going to the store, going fishing or playing some type of sport. Once you're reaching that point and nothing else is working, then you proceed on to surgical management. Now, surgical management, what it entails, this is the problem, a prosthesis or an example of a total knee prosthesis. And what it entails, we call it a replacement, but it's really a resurfacing procedure. And so basically you cut off the diseased surface of the bone and you replace it with these metal, with these metal shims or metal caps in order to give you another surface where the patient can put weight on it and not have any pain. Now we're not replacing the whole joint, but we're making these cuts into the bone specific for the patient in order to put these metal pieces on in order so that as they move, they can have mobility in their joint and not have any pain with that. And also we do things to help balance the joint out so that their knees are stable. Um, this is for the knee replacements and we have different sizes and different materials that we would use that are specific um, to the patient. Some of the advancements that we've done in knee surgery, a lot of it has to do mainly with um, the longevity of the implant. And basically, um, we've changed this plastic piece of what we call a bearing, where now these are more stable. So 20 years ago, we used to quote literature and say that these knee replacements, if you had them before the age of 60 and 65, you may need to get them to re um, be redone because these plastic pieces will wear out and you would need to get this changed. Nowadays, we've seen patients that have replacements last up to 25 or 30 years, and it's due to the advancements in the technology behind um, these replacements. Um, also, for the hip replacement, it's a similar thing, and it's another model where, once again, we're replacing that arthritic joint. We have a very smooth plastic piece in here that is very resistant to wear, which allows us to have that joint allow patients to have function with um, limited pain and mobility and um, improved mobility. Now, the typical use in this design for um, a total hip is that 
uh, the design or prosthesis, we have many different sizes of these things in order to try to make them specific for the patient. And so here I have a couple examples of different sizes of these implants that fit into the bone, depending on if you're really small or if you're a really large male and you need a much larger implant. But we have many sizes that we can put in these patients in order to give them something that's stable for them. Now, going off that point about giving the patient something stable or specific to them, everyone's body is different. Some people have bow legs, some people have knock knee, or some people have normal alignment. And so it's very important that we tailor our surgeries and our implants specifically to address the needs of the patient. And so in this case, sometimes when you're developing arthritis in your knees, you may notice that your legs are getting more bowed or they're getting more knock knee. And the goal in surgery is to give you something that's stable, but also brings you back to the alignment that you had previously. And so some of the advancements that we've made in technology allows us to do that and allows us to treat every patient individually. So the, the therapies that we're doing is treating everyone at the point or um, at the intersection of what they need. So this is a picture of a lot of surgeons are used to seeing this. This is how a back table or one of the tables in the operating room may look. And as you can see around, it's a bunch of different implants and a bunch of different tools that we use to do surgery. These tools allows us to measure specifically the angle of a alignment for cutting the bone in the patient. It also allows us to expose the surgical field and get things perfectly and specific for that patient. And so the guys that we use doing surgery, the whole goal of it is to give the patient an implant that is specific for them. Now, surgical training, as I stated earlier, is five years long. And then most of us also do an extra year of training in order to get even really much better and more focused in some of these type of procedures. And the reason for that length of training is because is to provide us with the expertise where we can do these surgeries and do it for different people with different sizes and in different walks of life and give everyone a good and successful outcome. Now, going a little bit into the design of the implants, like I stated earlier, there's been some advancements in the design where these poly pieces are now more resistant to wear, which allows them to last longer. Also the design of them, some of them are deeper dish than another in order to try to recreate the normal mechanics or the normal anatomy of patients. Now this implant in particular, where we're looking at, this is something that's came out over the last five years. And actually what it is, it's a total knee implant but at the bottom of this, it actually has an accelerometer attached to the shin portion of the implant right at the bottom here. And that actually allows the patient, it's almost like wearing an eye watch in your implant in your knee. And that allows the patient to connect to, to um, their implant to an app. So it measures the steps that they're taking. It measures how wide their steps are, how their gait is. Um, it lets us know how well they're doing in therapy and it gives us more information as a surgeon to know when the patients may be reaching a difficult point in their recovery or where they're having great success whether it be at therapy or whether it be at home but it provides us more information and so there's one company in particular that's um, coming out with these um, um, prosthesis that adds on to the bottom of this shin bone or what we call a tibial tray and it connects to and it gives the doctor and patient more information but it's something or an advancement in technology that we're using just to see how much more we can do to improve an outcome in patients now the big thing that most people hear about is robotics um, and robotic assisted surgery what that means is that if you see here, these are three of some of the main um, robots that people are familiar with, with doing assisted joint replacement surgery. The one on the far left is the Mako robot, which probably is one of the more well-known and one of the first um, mainstream um, uh, robots that were um, available for people to use. The next one is the Velis, and the last one there is the Rosa. Overall, there's no real difference between what these robots offer. Um, it's basically surgical preference in which one, one person or another will use. These robots don't actually do the surgery for us, but it makes us what we call more reproducible. Meaning that if I want to cut a certain amount of bone off or at a certain angle, I can do that normally without using these based off the years of training and the amount of surgeries we've done. We've built up an eye for it to know exactly what we're doing. The robot, what it provides is validation. So it lets us know like you plan to cut off this much bone and that's exactly how much you cut off. Or you plan to cut at this angle and that's exactly what you did. 
Some of the robots require advanced imaging like a CAT scan or an MRI in order to look and plan out the surgery, while some of them from only require x-ray and actually some of them now require no advanced imaging where you can plan out the um, surgery um, while you're doing it. And it allows you to make all of these decisions before the surgery so that it increases your surgical time and allows you to move quickly to do the patient's procedure, but that case and what you're doing is specific for that patient. I have an example here of this right here. This is what I was given in fellowship, and it's just an example of a tool that we would normally use during surgery um, with these robots. And this is like a validation tool where we use this and we put it on the edges of the bone as we are marking just to make sure that whatever we see on the image is exactly what we see in the body. Once again, making sure that we're validating our cuts and that whatever we're doing is specific for that patient that we're treating. Now, outside of robotic assisted surgeries, there are other different types of robots or other things that we can use that um, also can help us during surgery and planning our surgery. These um, particular implants are called accelerometers. And what they do, they are like basically little phone size um, implants or things that we can put on the, um, the same tools that we use to do the surgery without any um, technology. We can attach these um, phones or we can attach these um, um, electronics to those jigs. And then once again, it tells us exactly at what angle or how much bone we're resecting. And it lets us once again, plan our surgery and validates for us that we're doing what we think we're doing. Once again, the take home theme is to specifically treat every patient differently and basically giving them an implant or a surgery that's specific for them. So these are just different types that different companies make up. Um, but every surgeon, like I said, has their own preference of what they like to use. And these options, they're not better or worse than the robotic assisted surgeries. It's just another option to use to plan a patient's surgery. And um, lastly, one of the emerging technologies that is coming out is being tested at multiple centers. Um, I've actually met one of the um, the developers of one of these um, insight um, from augmented reality. Um, goggles that you wear doing surgery. And as you can see, what it does is gives you an overlay in your surgical field of uh, what you're planning to do during the surgery. So instead of having a device that has to be sterile that I have directly during surgery that helps me plan the procedure, these are actually something that sits on your head, frees up your hand, frees up your field from having a machine or anything in it, and it can also help you plan to do the surgery. Um, there are some surgeons out in Boston already starting to use this. Um, and once again, this, this does not make the surgeon, it doesn't make the surgery um, any less complicated than it is. All it is is once again, another tool that we can use in order to validate what we're doing and making sure we are um, doing and what we plan to do for that patient. And the last thing I wanted to cover is patient specific implants. Now, if you look here, these are 3D printed guides that after getting a CAT scan or MRI, multiple companies do this, where I can get a guide that fits perfectly on a patient's bone, even with all the arthritis that the patient may have. I don't remove any of it. I would place this guide directly on their bone and it would guide me to making the perfect cuts in order to balance that patient's knee out perfectly. Now on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, that's a uh, up in the pelvis. And in some cases, when you're doing a large revision surgery of a pelvis, sometimes you need to use larger prosthesis. And that's actually, once again, a 3D printed guide that basically um, you can place inside of the pelvis and shows you, um, or it helps you um, know where the good bone is to place the implant. So once again, you can have something specific and stable for the patient. So in summary, the point that I'm trying to get across in this talk is that there's a lot of technology that's kind of pushing the field forward, both increasing the longevity of the implants, um, but both increasing satisfaction to patients um, and also giving patients a prosthesis or a surgery that's specific for them. The advantages for that is that it makes, allows patients to leave the hospital sooner that gives them less pain. And during surgery, we have to release less tissue in order to balance the joint properly. And so all in all, the goal of this is to use technology to improve outcomes by making surgery more specific for each patient, since each patient is different.
With that being said, thank you guys for tuning in to my live, and I hope that you learned a little bit about technology and how it relates to joint replacement. Um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to contact me. There's many surgeons in your area, all over Virginia, um, that does multiple different types of um, um, assistive surgery, whether it be a true actual robotic assistive surgery or whether you're using some other device. But all in all, even if you don't use these devices during surgery, um, all in all, the implants and things that we're putting in patients is uh, are things that are um, advancing the field and helping people. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Eminari. We have a bunch of questions. Okay. So one of them is, is robotics better suited for hip or knee surgeries? So a lot of the robotics that I showed, a lot of the technology right now is for knee surgery, but it's suited for both hip and knee surgery. Also, like I stated earlier, there's also robotics in shoulder and ankle surgery. Um, every company has a different profile for their instruments that they're using in order to give you that platform. But I would say most of the application um, are, most of the robotic assisted applications are for the knee portion of total knee replacement. But there is a fair amount for hips as well. Thank you. What is the recovery time after a robotic replacement? So the recovery time will be the same after a total knee or total hip replacements that is done with manual without using any assistance. Usually what I tell patients is that usually around the four to six week mark, they should be feeling pretty good um, as far as returning back to certain activities and not using walking aids. Personally, I believe the full recovery time, in my opinion, is six months to a year because when you have arthritis for such an extended period of time, it takes time to rebuild back up that muscular strength. But all in all, most patients that I do surgery on, I usually write them out of work for three months. Most of them return back to work before then and they're feeling pretty good. Everyone's recovery is slightly different, but I'll say around the three month mark, most patients are back to almost baseline where they were before and back to regular activities. Thank you. Do you take measurements of the knee before the surgery to select the implant size? Yeah, so if you notice, sometimes your surgeon may have you um, get x-rays in clinic or even sometimes before surgery, and they may have something called a marker ball in the x-ray. You may see like a little white ball and you're like, why is that there? Oftentimes we use that as a calibration uh, material so that we can plan the implants for the surgery that we're going to use. Um, this, is, this allows us to have the things, proper implants ready for surgery. Um, also, it allows us to know exactly, um, gives us a little bit more information before surgery so that we know what to expect going in. Um, the way that these implants are made now, there's so many sizes to them. Usually, um, the biggest worry or the biggest thing that you want to worry about having available is just like you have really large um, patients or really small patients. But yes, we do plan the surgeries before we do it so that we can make sure we have everything available. Also, there are technologies now available where you can actually do the planning right before you make incision. You can take pictures of the x-ray and plan your surgery right before you make the cut so that um, you know exactly what sizes the patient may need um, so that you can be ready at that time during the surgery. Thank you. How long does a knee replacement surgery take? And is it longer or shorter with these technologies? Good question, good question. So normally for a hip and knee replacement, it takes about, depending on the surgeon speed or their acumen, it takes about usually one to two hours to do those surgeries. Usually what I tell patients is that um, when they get into the OR, what I tell patients and families is that from the time they arrive into the OR to the time they leave, it's usually on average around an hour and a half to two hours long. Um, now, most surgeons, if you are well, well versed in doing robotic surgery or using any of these technologies, you've done a lot of cases with them and it doesn't take away from your surgical time. It's usually still about the same amount of time. But I will say that there's been countless research articles and publications that show that the surgical time may be a little bit longer um, with using the robot simply because instead of going through the normal steps of making the incision, planning it out and making the cuts. You have to validate the robot and make sure everything is set up so that when you use it, that you know that you're getting accurate information. 
But most surgeons that do these surgeries often, their time is neutral. So it's the same amount of time, even if they weren't using it. Thank you. So two related questions. Is there a desired or required BMI for joint replacement surgery? And if you lose weight in order to have a joint replacement and then you later regain it, does it cause the implant to fail? Uh, okay. Um, so is there a required BMI? So the historic data or what most of us do even nowadays is that a BMI of 40, a body mass index of 40 is usually the cutoff a lot of surgeons use. Um, there has been data published that states that um, your uh, risk of a complication may be higher if your BMI is greater than 40. But there's also a lot of new data out there that says that if you do surgeries on larger patients, they do just as well. So to simplify, most surgeons use the BMI cutoff of 40 and below 40, they'll do the surgery. But there are indications where um, if a patient is very large and they lost a lot of weight, but they have excess skin, they may not be able to get their BMI below there, but they may just as be as healthy. They may be just as healthy. Um, but personally for me, I can only speak for myself. I use a BMI cutoff of 40, but there are surgeons and doctors that um, do surgery higher than that, that have excellent weight. And what was the second part of your, your question? If somebody loses weight in order to meet the BMI cutoff for surgery, and then they later regain that weight, is that going to cause the implants to fail? Now, so the way the implants are placed and the way they're fixed to the bone, even if you were to gain weight, they're still supposed to support your weight and keep you balanced. Now, there may be other factors that can lead to the implant failing that oftentimes is something that we can't predict or expect. But there's many patients that get this surgery and for one reason or another, they may gain weight later down the line. And we're not seeing those people come back because of that weight gain and need for vision surgeries. Especially with the fact that with these newer implants that are um, more resistant to wear, um, there's a less likelihood that they, they will run down the joint and need something to be replaced. So, um, now, increasing your weight after surgery, obviously, we would like you to to maintain your weight. But if you do gain weight after surgery, it's not something that's going to lead to you failing. Thank you. If a new technology or a new type of robot comes out, how do you learn to use it? So there is a learning curve for using these kind of um, instruments. Most surgeons, like I went to fellowship where I was trained to use both two robots and I did over 50 cases on each. Um, most surgeons, the way that you learn to use it is first you go to a lab where you're not operating on a patient, but you're operating on bone models and sometimes a cadaver. And you use the robot to learn all the steps of how to use it. And then oftentimes you will go um, follow another surgeon, maybe in another state or another county that uses that robot to learn and watch them do the surgeries in order to understand how they're using it and different ways that you can apply that robot to your surgeries. And then when you're starting your using the robot in surgery, you may um, do some cases with one of your partners that uses that robot so that while you're in the procedure, you can make sure if um, anything was to change that you have somebody right there that has the experience. So most doctors and on top of that, hospitals also require you to have not only a baseline of training on the robot, but also to show um, documentation that you've had like, a certain amount of cases using that robot before they will let you do those surgeries at the hospital. So in order to do something new like this, a lot of doctors, they go through extensive training in order to make sure that when they're doing the surgeries that their patient is getting the best option. Thank you. You talked about patients having sort of bow legs and knock knees. So if a patient has knock knees and they're having a total knee replacement, will the knock knees go away or will it not because of other pressure that it puts on the implants? So for that, um, if the patient's legs were normally straight and their leg has become knock kneed due to the arthritis, then when you are doing the surgery, you try your best in order to recreate straightening their leg because that's the way it was before. 
Now, there are patients that were born with their legs normally not knee, okay? Without any arthritis, as they grow up, their legs were not knee, and if they develop an increase or progressive um, deformity due to arthritis, you try to bring them back to their normal, meaning that you may not try to bring their legs back to completely straight, but you try to bring them back to what's normal for them. But if your leg was completely straight and it bowed out or bowed in due to the arthritis, during surgery, we try to bring you back to what's normal for you. Thank you. If my surgeon doesn't use robots, is that okay or should they all be using robots now? Uh, that's practically permanent. Like I said, the way that we learn how to do this, you first have to learn how to do all these surgeries manually without robots because as you know, with computers, phones, watches, um, sometimes technology can fail you. And in the moment when you're doing a surgery, you need to be able to deal without it. So like I said, it's just a tool that a surgeon uses to be more accurate and more reproducible. But most of us, all of us that do these surgeries, we can do it without the robot. If the robot wasn't there, we can still do the exact same thing, but it's just something that we like to use that's helpful for us to um, do the procedure. So if you had a total knee replacement or joint replacement, your surgeon didn't use a robot, it's absolutely fine. Your outcomes are going to be the same. Thank you. Are you able to kneel after a knee replacement? Yes, you are. Thank you. Are the muscles around the knee cut? And if so, how long does it take them to recover? Okay. So, um, I remember when I was in training, there were some advertisements in my area that said certain surgeons don't cut the tendon. Um, what they meant by that is that they don't cut through one of the muscles or the tendon in order to do the joint replacement. Um, in order to do a total knee replacement, you have to cut something in order to open the joint. You either cut a little bit into the muscle or you cut a little bit into the tendon. Every surgeon has their own preference of what Kind of procedure or how they like to do that procedure but you have to cut something along the knee in order to get in there to do the surgery so in that regard for the knee some surgeons may deviate their incision and go a little bit into the muscle while some surgeons go up the tendon there's no difference in the outcomes of this, regardless of what procedure they like to do it's all about what the surgeon is comfortable with and what their expertise is now um, looking at the hip depending on if you're going through the front, doing an anterior approach, or doing a posterior, or even a lateral approach. Each approach is different, and in some approaches, you may have to split the muscle in order to get down to the joint. Um, but it all depends on, once again, what the surgeon is comfortable with. Two years after surgery, the outcomes, regardless of approach, is still the same. Um, the rate of complications or issues is low in both surgeries, regardless of what approach the surgeon uses. So. Um, to answer your question that, yes, some surgeons cut the muscle or cut the tendon. You have to cut something or separate something to get back to the joint to do the replacement. But if your surgeon is skilled in doing his, surg his or her surgery that way, your outcomes will still be the same. Okay, thank you so much. We are out of time. If we did not get a chance to answer your question live, we will answer it in the comments. Dr. Eminari, would you like to close? I'll close by saying that thank you. It's an honor to give you guys a talk about something that I'm passionate about. Um, I think joint replacement surgery in orthopedics is the best field. <laughs> but uh, I think that um, we help a lot of patients and I think the way the technology is advancing, I'm hoping that um, patients that get joint replacements, you know, will have uh, better outcomes, shorter hospital stays, less payment requirements, and, you know, get back to the normal activity that they like to do. But I hope you learned a little bit about technology and joints, and I hope I didn't go too technical with this stuff and you guys understood. Uh, but once again, I think knowledge is power, and I'm happy to be able to have this platform in front of you.